Hi, I'm Jeannie Ballou, and welcome to Jeannie on the Beat, talking with the talent, Ann Arbor's newest talk variety show, where I'll bring you up close and personal with fabulous writers and performers. And tonight, I am thrilled to introduce two brilliant young poets, Perry Janes and Jennifer Scholes. Perry Janes currently attends the University of Michigan Ann Arbor as a double major in English and film. He is the recipient of four Hopwood Awards, U of M's highly prestigious writing award, a Paul and Sonia Handelman Poetry Award, and a Roy and Helen Meter Writing Award. His work has recently appeared in the literary journals Salt Hill and The Collegist. Jennifer Scholes graduated from Kalamazoo College in June with a BA in Fine Arts. She is the author of two chapbooks and is an award-winning writer having won first place in Albion College's statewide poetry contest two years in a row, a partial scholarship to Hawaii State University for her poetry, and a number of other national and local contests. She has just completed an independent study in poetry at Kalamazoo. Welcome to Geneva and Perry. I am so happy to have you here. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, Perry, can you tell us a little bit about the latest project that you've been working on with your poetry? Sure, sure. Uh, about two years ago now, I started writing a sequence uh, on the life and times of the inventor Nikola Tesla, who came over from Serbia around the turn of the century and is often cited as being Edison's greatest competition of the day. Um, he was responsible for inventing the alternating current model for electricity, which we here in the United States use as a primary power source, as do many countries mm -hmm. across the world. He's also recognized in many countries in Europe as being the inventor of the radio, which is something that we oh, don't really? really think of here because we've, we credit Guglielmo Mar Marconi as being the inventor of the radio, but that's actually uh, up for debate. Um, but more than just being a fascinating scientist, he was a really fascinating human being. Um, the more that I began to research about him, I learned that in his childhood he suffered from something that's called eidetic hallucinations, which means that specific words would trigger imagery and memories that would superimpose over his vision. It was like a form of blindness. Um, wow. So from a very young age, I think that he grappled with issues of control. Mm -hmm. Similarly, also even with his own feelings of desire, that would became a, a theme in the manuscript because from a young age, his father was a firebrand preacher, and it is even suggested that his brother died on horseback while riding to meet a young woman who he may or may not have been in love with. Um, and so throughout his entire life, I think Tesla was someone who really grappled with needing to feel in control, mm -hmm. which made him a very interesting subject for poetry because, of course, mm -hmm. here's an inventor who's working with primarily electricity, which is a wild, untamable element. And so the more that I got into that and what that really meant for him as a person and his inventions, the, the more the manuscript grew. So that's what I've been working on. Wow, that is fascinating. I've heard a lot about Tesla. I think he's quite a, quite a character. He is. Rather he eccentric. Was he was very eccentric. Never yes. married. Never married. Famously celibate. That goes back to his issues with romantic intimacy. Uh, he claimed that women distracted him from his work, uh -huh. when, of course, in reality, in my opinion, that stemmed from his childhood and what happened there. Um, but he was also a famous showman. He was famous for uh, the exhibitions in which he would actually run high current, high voltage electricity through his body, wow. which is also something that we haven't really seen replicated since. There's still talk and question for how he really did that. And he huh. claimed that that actually kept him healthy and sane. Really? Which is also <laughs> arguable how sane Tesla was there at <laughs> the end of his life. But um, yeah. Performance arts, really. Right. He, <laughs> was, he was a character all around. He's a fascinating subject. Well, I would love to hear you read some of your poems. Certainly. That yeah. you've written about him. So the poems that I have chosen for tonight are actually excerpted from A Crown of Sonnets, which means that they're all linked. And I chose these poems because they're in various different voices. Some are in Nikola Tesla's voice, one is in J.P. Morgan's voice, uh, one is in Edison's voice, and so on. So I thought that it would give a good overview for the time period and the themes that I'm working with. So the, the crown is called Kinetic, and there's an epigraph. Throughout space, there is energy. Is this energy static or kinetic? If static, our hopes are in vain. If kinetic, and this we know it is for certain, then it is a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very wheelwork of nature. Nikola Tesla. One, 
Nikola Tesla remembers. Manhattan, 1892, after exhaustion and lack of sleep, has led to temporary amnesia. Who knows what this next age will bring, what growth I can expect. Answers lay at the root of each structure, so I step into myself like a street I know but can't name. The manhole steam clothes the road while it undresses names from street signs, tongues from bells. Buildings shuck their stonework blouses like corn in my mother's hands, like smilgen houses stripped and cloaked in a blinding bed of sleet. But there's current underneath my feet, a rope of charge that lights the fog. It's what I hope to capture from sun, barrel into air, what I'm stunned to see when a woman smiles, and there, at her laughter's tap root, a place I'll never know, I find it sitting in the tongue's back row. Two, J.P. Morgan defines human potential energy. Washington, D.C., 1913, after the Pujols Committee has tried Morgan for antitrust and monopoly laws. You find it sitting in the tongue's back row, the cherry pit of a kiss or cry. Why not reach to taste its promise? I remember being young, being choked by my father's voice welded to my throat. Now I wheeze with the secret. I realize the world piece by piece, merge and rise with every union. How did it come unyoked? Tesla, they'll celebrate you for a moment and turn on you the next. Humans are no different than flame, visible when inertia shifts, rushing through even the quietest street, rising from the wreck, howling at the mention of your name. Three. Edison invents the electric chair. Menlo Park, 1889. Edison's propaganda machine works day and night to discredit Tesla and Westinghouse's model for alternating current electricity. Howling at the mention of your name, two strays circle a slab of rotten meat. I study their moves with wonder, knowing the one who gets the steak survives. The other, wet fur, belt strapped, Iron-plated paws, Westinghouse, for an audience. I was born bullheaded and bleeding. In this war of currents, I take the direct route. Film the electrocution of an elephant. Scream, killer current. I'll be damned before I double back. This onwards rush must have a finish. There at the end is a man. Wet flesh, belt strapped to a chair, my voice from the speakers. Come, see what man's light can do to him. Four, the working man builds. Manhattan, 1898. Tesla's oscillator shakes several city blocks, and he is famously quoted as saying how easily he could have destroyed the Brooklyn Bridge. See what man's light can do to him. I spend my weeks lining walls with wires and each day, the paper teaches me something new. Say how an engine's small vibrations can send shutters through the sidewalk, like a man filled with his own failed love gets the shakes. Something that pounds beneath his feet sets him running for escape. Well, it's easier to build than to destroy. Each day at work, I grope by a bulb's cold light in dark rooms, my hands Unsteady while I work, feeding charge and fuel to more machines. Each day, I hope to find my home blazing in light, my wife equal to the fire, lit with her own life. Five, Nikola Tesla discovers desire. Colorado Springs, 1899. Tesla builds his magnifying transmitter outside Pikes Peak, an area famous for its frequent lightning strikes and causes a national stir over the city's strange electrical phenomena present during its operation. Equal to fire, lightning arcs between lampposts. Even snow bursts with static. Drawn by my electric coil, young couples in dark rooms come unbound again, again. Polarized apart,
They crush together. Their touch circles the body, unable to land. But you can always find more want. Who knew butterflies rode currents along horizon's naked back? Erupting with quiet deaths, their ash coats the windows like breath on both sides. Lit with my own life, I've sent so much charge into the ground, I've magnetized myself in two. Catherine, I am jealous of the currents that find you miles away to charge through your blood. I am angry with my hands, the way I spend my life waiting for shock. An inventor's life is made of questions. What frequency does desire travel? Every day, the universe expands. Molecules are pulled farther apart. I am left with halves I cannot reconcile. You and the world, myself and myself. Thank you, Perry. Those are beautiful, amazing poems. What inspired you to write about him and, and to continue writing on this theme? Well, I think initially what really inspired me about Tesla, or actually even before that, what I was interested in was connecting the human experience to science. Mm -hmm. It's something that some of my favorite poetry books have done or tried to do, and it's something that I was interested in exploring. There are so many interesting parallels between scientific research and physics in particular, and the ways in which we experience the world. Um, and so I saw Tesla as a conduit for that at first. That was what led me to write poems on him from the beginning. And then once I began writing, before even I became enamored with Tesla as a character, as a human being, I became really interested in the time period itself, the American age of inventions, the age of industry. It was a time when everything seemed possible. You know, today it seems unfathomable to think of inventing something like electricity. Mm. That's completely outside my frame of reference. And that was something that I was really interested in and was another reason that I was drawn to Tesla from the beginning. Something, inventing something that is so integral to our everyday life mm. and that is so multifaceted. Electricity is just a power source mm. and it powers any number of things that we interact with on a daily basis. I can't imagine life without it. And uh -huh. so that time period was atmospheric and rich to me for mining. Mm -hmm. And then of course, as I said earlier, I became interested in Tesla as a human being mm -hmm. and his issues with control and with romance. Mm -hmm. And as I continue going forth and writing, I've actually for the most part concluded my sequence on Tesla. And I've begun to write poems in the contemporary moment about living in Detroit in what is really a post-industrial landscape and how there's that cause and effect and those two really antithetical mind frames and how they speak to one another. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what's kept me rolling with these poems. That's very exciting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Geneva, can you tell us about your latest collection of poems? Yeah, this uh, collection is called A Hand on a Handle and every poem in it is an object poem which means that all the poem is focused on one specific thing. In my collection, they're all objects of domesticity. They're all things that you will find within the sphere of the home. And um, the thing that's fun for me about an object poem is that it really shakes up the language that you use or that I use when I'm writing, um, really forces me to um, look through things through a new lens. It gives you sort of a sense of freedom. You can talk about your own personal experience and your emotional life and your, uh, your trials, but it's through the voice of something else. So it kind of liberates you to say whatever you want. You're, you're free to, um, to, to use that voice and to use that persona. And so a lot of the poems in this collection are told literally from the voice of a specific object. Many of them are appliances. I like the appliances because they, um, they have more of a sense of action. You know, they respond to human touch. The, the microwave oven is, is put into action because, because you're, you're touching it and you're interacting with it and your intention is what brings it to life. And that was something I was really interested in, in exploring in these poems. Um, but a lot of what came out was my own personal feelings and my history. And so they, there's a real range um, between the different poems. I'd love to hear you read some. 
All right. Yeah. Um, this one that I'll start off with is uh, one of those that is told from the perspective of the object. And it's titled, The Toaster Oven Tells the Big Oven How It Feels. So what if you can make a turkey? How often does anyone want a freaking turkey? You think you can just lounge there in the corner and do nothing? and then take all the credit at the birthday party because you made the cake. I fed the child. I kept her alive. Did the daily work, the small and dull things that keep it all going. Soldiered through monotony because I thought that's what was needed. The same bread every time, toasted to the same degree. Isn't that what was asked for? I do what is asked for. I'm good at it. I am reliable, but I don't have to be. You have no idea. You imagine size is power. You know nothing of the fire and wires I keep inside. If you wanted a big gesture, if you wanted to impress your guests with something unforgettable, maybe I should have burned down the house. All right. <laughs> um, Others in the collection, they're still object poems, but they're, uh, they use the object as a platform to jump off of and to think about and talk about other things. And this one was written in response to an event that happened in my neighborhood. Dead bolt. Thick slabs of brass house a bolt that pulses forward across the slivered gap at the touch of a thumb. A lunge like a hermit crab uncoiling that same startling snap. Tawny brushed disc above it like a sun with the slice taken out. Little aperture waiting for entry. These are the charms the woman who lives here hits with her fingertips every time she goes in or out. Good luck. A mezuzah. A scroll full of angels. An amulet on the arm of the door for protection. The promise of safety in a scrap of metal. Like a wedding band. Like a penny. Like a gold cross. The woman who lives here closes her door to leave and turns a key. The men who smash the window steal everything. Um, something else that I really worked on and got to explore and have fun with in this collection was working in form and I just started making up my own forms and I really enjoyed trying to create a form that would be in response to the object that I was writing about. So um, this one is just, I just made this up, <laughs> this form, and I felt like I really wanted to get at the sense of rhythm and the sense of movement in the object that I was talking about. So this poem is about a washing machine, and it is called Wash Cycle. I cleaned you. I moved you. I broke you in. I turned you. I formed you. I wore you thin. I rub on your shoulder, and you fall and fold over, and we dampen at the edges and begin. I move in a circle, and you move in a circle, and we wrap around each other, and we spin. We're sweet on each other and we beat on each other till you're soft by a stranger's skin. I bathed you, I soothed you, I broke you in, I held you, I warmed you, I wore you thin. It's so beautiful. Um, this one is another one that is from the perspective of the object, and it's titled Home Pregnancy Test. I am a translator of the body. <clears throat> like the finger to the pulse that confirms your continuing heart, I divine life. I tell you your own secret. It's been a long time since you lost the old language, the easy rhythm of animals. Your blood wants to talk to you. Your brain, your belly, and bones are full of messages, and I can't tell you what they say. I am no riddling sphinx. I'm no swooning oracle. You get one question only and one answer. I am a witness of near misses and a witness of new worlds. I see you seeing those little phantoms that fade in daylight 
or settle into matter and pull you forward, growing into weight unimaginable and unimaginable still while you are caught in the net of seconds as the truth creeps up into being. That shock you feel across your skin like the wildest fever watching the ghost appear in your hands, that is nothing. That is the tease of God. I am the partitioner of universes. I rope off those rampaging rampaging futures that have careened like loosed horses, like tornadoes through your chest. I have blocked off all those gray revolving doors of your brain and hung a heavy velvet cord to say, step this way, step up into this world, and you are now on the up escalator into yes or no, black and white, wrong or right is up to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, This last poem uh, I included because it really shows how the object can just be a platform and a starting point and it can really take you unexpected and surprising places and holds a lot of potential um, that you just don't know before you begin where things are going to end up. And so this poem really surprised me as I was writing it. And it's titled Copy Machine Meditation on Mary Magdalene. You press against her smooth into smooth, lay her down in the light and sear her ghost into paper. Again and again blaze through her and she falls, warm and new, onto herself again and again. When the movement ends and the hum settles, who are you holding? A frame of shadow, thin and endless, seven devils in her belly waiting to be seen, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, the hairdresser, the penitent, the liver of a virtuous life, the sinner, the witness, who watched when you went up and when you came down and down and up again, the woman who bathed your body in tears and the one who kissed it clean, a hundred women with the same face. Those are beautiful poems, Jennifer. Thank you so much for sharing. I Mm. love them. No problem. Thanks for having (laughs) me. Yeah. Uh, So I'm interested to hear from both of you. Why do you think that poetry is relevant today? Um, Well, I'll start with that. Um, I think that one of the things when I was thinking about uh, that question that came up in has been really influential in my life is there's kind of a lot of talk about how our lives and our communication has been sort of diluted and is a little less genuine because of um, the encroachment of technology into our lives and that a lot of our communication takes place through some other medium through Facebook or through text messaging and um, what poetry really offers is a very genuine connection and I don't mean that necessarily just really kind of esoteric, you know, um, for your own personal growth, but I mean really literally, physically, it's a space to meet other people and talk with other people who share the same kind of passions and, and interests that you do. If you're involved in your, in your poetry community and you are um, going to slams or you're going to competitions or readings or open mics and you're out there sharing your work, chances are you're going to meet people that you find are really fascinating Mm -hmm. and so I think of it as a very concrete way of connecting with people not just Mm -hmm. through your writing but through the process of sharing your writing Mm -hmm. in a public space. Great, that's awesome. How about you Perry? Do you have any thoughts on that? Anything you want to add? A a little. uh, Geneva said most of the highlights there. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree that I think that there is something unique about the way in which technology, I mean there's this the way you put it, encroaching on our lives. But it is true. I mean, yeah. Facebook and email and, you know, smartphones, it's something that goes with us everywhere now. And I think in addition to poetry simply allowing you to connect with other people in a more real way, mm-hmm. it's important really for the same reason I think that it has always been important in that poetry is about a distillation of a single experience or a single emotion in a way that feels very true to the author, and whoever is writing it, self-expression, being able to connect with other people through that expression of self. And it is unique and stands apart from fiction and other forms 
of literature, at least in that distillation of experience. So speaking of connection, you two have an interesting story of your friendship. <laughs> Can you tell us about it? Um, yeah, I mean, Perry and I have been friends for a really long time. We met as <laughs> little kids and um, have maintained a friendship. Even we lived in different cities and um, have been sending our writing back and forth to each other for quite a long time now, even starting back in middle and high school. We yep. wrote each other letters and, <laughs> and um, I've really, it's been a pleasure for me to watch your writing really mature over time and um, see all of the, the new stuff that you're learning and really being able to talk with you. Yeah, it's been great. same. And I'm very grateful to you for wading through what has certainly been a fair share of pretty awful poems uh, <laughs> in my day. So I'm very grateful. Um, you know, and in certain ways, I think that you've even contributed to my growth and development. And uh -huh. it's, been, it's been a very, a very valuable friendship. Great. Mm -hmm. I love that it's story of connection. You know, that really even in just in your poetry, it's a story of connection. Um, can you take us out with some poems? Do you have some, a uh, couple to share as we close out? All right. So we have our time for a one minute quick poem. And uh, now for something completely different. <laughs> okay. uh, this is another poem from my series, and I just kind of. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll just go for it. This is titled, Love Poem from a Thing I Don't Love That Won't Take No for an Answer. Get up. Lover, you don't got no alarm clock. You got a radio signal that sings on cue. One major chord smorgasbord just for you. I shove sound into sleepers, life into the dead. And I don't allow a resting head. I'll put up my trumpet and blow you a reveille. Your own private bugle boy of Company B bring in the boogie to your breakfast, saying, Soldier, you got a body built to last, built to breathe and fight and dance, so get up, lover. Put on some pants. The world is calling, and this is your chance to wake up, stand up, stretch out of your dreams, clean your body, pull on your jeans. Whatever you're fighting, you're going to be winning, so get up, lover. This is just the beginning. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Perry, for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. It was a delight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Yeah.